G'day brothers and sisters, this is The Other Paul and welcome back for another fun stream with my first ever legendary collab partner, the man who helped me make my channel as it is right now and with whom I have some of the best banter ever, my man Jeff, a go for Jesus. How are you going Yo, tonight, mate? How's everything going, man? Very well on my end, very well. And this stream was your idea, so how about you like quickly run us down what we're going to okay. discuss tonight? Okay, so... The idea I had for this was came out of um, the Nicaea 2 reactions to Gavin Ortland. And I, I don't want to rehash that. You did a really good stream on that and that sort of thing. But um, some of um, uh, the uh, guy on Twitter, Kemi180 or whatever, he has that meme I, I, I use all the time where it's like, all right, all the apostolic evidence for Nicaea 2 shows Icon Dulia is not apostolic. Uh, all the, and then so you have the 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 orthodox reaction is you know a joke view of history, reject the data. And the, the Catholic view yes. is is my development, you know, just say and which contradicts Nicaea 2. Um and uh, was it Aiken and Horn had a had a stream where they they basically said, and uh, I've seen some other Catholics online go this approach as opposed to the uh, the reject the data approach. Hmm. Was that yeah? Uh, Nicaea two uh, Nicaea two was an error in terms of its reasoning. But its conclusion is is uh, is infallible. And then I, I was I was thinking to myself, well, where do you go from there? Hmm. And really, you can't go anywhere from there. Hmm. And saying, well, that is the endpoint of Catholic apologetics, because or our interactions with Catholics mm. is you do, you show that they've twisted themselves up into pretzels and that they're doing mental gymnastics that they'll just do whatever they it'll take to keep their system propped open up, you know, mm. and just like, that's it. That's all you can do. That's you yeah. just leave it at that. Um, it's kind of also, I heard someone once say like same thing with like a Mott and Bailey argument where, you know, the, the Mott is the, uh, the Bailey is where you want to be, but it's not defensible. And the Mott is the, like the castle up on the Hill. That's more defensible mm. is to point out what they're doing is really in that situation is all what you need to do. It, that's it. Like, like, <clears throat> so the, well, it's infallible but their reasoning is not protected and they're getting historical facts wrong. Um, uh, it, it, that, I mean, what, that's it. Yeah. I see. Uh, um, was that, I uh, go back one. Was that, oh, yeah. um, is that Craig? Yeah, that's Craig. My man. Good to see you, Craig. Uh, uh, good without playing. Yeah, that's it. It's like, and I'm okay with people disagreeing about the data and stuff, but when they agree on the data and then they, uh, they're, they're just like, well, you know, Rome said it. And if, if, if Rome's, and, and I think this comes down and what we'll discuss later is that yeah. if they're just, a lot of them are afraid of the abyss of, of relativism or, um, they kind of agree with a lot of the skeptical relativistic mm. uh, arguments. Yep. A and they just kind of arbitrarily picked Rome to pull them out of it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I'll even, I'll even acknowledge this. Catholic answer does not give the best arguments of Catholicism. I think half right, half not. I think some issues are just so, just so decisive against them that they do end up giving the best arguments and they still suck. But then in other ones, yes, they are like the they are a more pop level organization, and so you'll you'll have much more sophisticated Catholics like 
um, Christian Wagner, Alan Rule, and even they will like cringe in their direction. And when you read their stuff, especially Wagner, the stuff he has available, much more sophisticated, much more yeah. clear, um, <coughs> much more interactive things, things that are honest and don't try to score points and they mm -hmm. get to the bone of it. So that's much, much better. Um, so that we have my boy, the catechumens in the chat. Oh man, I hope this is a normal thing. He and my live chats, mine and he, uh, me and his in the Catholic view, the only things preserved from error and ecumenical council are dogmatic definitions of theology. Yeah. Yeah. We know that. And, and that's kind of a thing we have a bit of a problem with. Like when we look at like the historical self understandings of certain councils in particular, as well as the ramifications of that worldview, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what we have a problem with. And just before we continue, I would like to acknowledge my most uh, persistent troll right now, my man Basuli's here. You want to go for another ride on the pot trick train? Be my guest. You're just going in a circle. Be back. We'll be back moving on to other things. What happened, Paul Lai? Aiken whoops your ass. So now you just see the ghost. So context, people. This guy's been trolling my comments for a long while since... Um, I forget when, but it's not too long ago. Uh, he's just helping um, the algorithms, man. So I, don't worry about yeah, it. look, I seem to be living rent-free in his head. I don't see the coping and seething um anywhere it appears to be him wasting his time coming on my streams coming on my comments and um expressing whatever self-hatred he has within himself so i'm not even i'm not even going to block him or report him i'll just i'll just let you see throughout my comments as i ignore you the whole time what a swine hey man it's not kosher come on let's be real man <laughs> all right peter peter diamond is my favorite catholic Pro correction peter diamond is my favorite protestant apologist <laughs> <laughs> oh man but anyway really quickly before we get onto the meat i would like to appreciate the the, the layers of depth on the thumbnail that i have here um i hope people can oh, yeah. really appreciate this so uh, what fe what features do you notice in this jeff in this beautiful thumbnail uh well the the despair soy jack or whatever he's called and then the black pill right mm -hmm. yep do you notice the background It looks like an empty office or something. You need you need to get back in your meme game. It's the back rooms, my dude. That's ba it's basically like some big internet creepy pasta lore thing. It's like this, um, it's like this forbidden pocket dimension that people note clip into, and it's just this empty fluorescent lighting office with like damp floors, and there's like these creepy horror entities that go throughout it, and people eventually get killed by them. And ah. so Catholic answers is, is, is one of these entities. And when it gotcha, finds the, gotcha. an unsuspecting straggler in the back, in the back rooms, it just, it feeds them black pills. So that's, that's what he's being fed right here. And that's because that's basically the theme of this stream that this brand of Roman apologetics, it is trying to sell Romanism by black pills. It's trying to feed people black pills with respect to like epistemology, certainty, Oh, how can you be sure of this? How can you be sure of that? How can you solve this unity? And it black pills you until you want to. Oh, we got the solution, boys. Come join us. Basically, the theme of this stream. Yeah, and I, I, we've mentioned it before, but it's like, you know, Catholics argue a lot with um, pro with Protestants in mind, and uh, to just on the papacy kind of maybe with Eastern Orthodox in mind. But when a push comes to shove, if you start adding extra people to the mix, like atheists or Jehovah's Witnesses or other people, you know, that sort of thing. And then you like look at what they're saying. Like if, if an atheist walked in and they're using all these skeptical arguments, they, they'd be they'd be trounced. Mm. They, yeah. they, they, they would they, the, the atheists would just take all their skeptical arguments, throw them in their face and uh go on their way so that's right that's right um and i think one key thing that i'll point out sometime tonight um is the ultimate problem of their concerted arguments against scriptural perspicuity not that anyone's asserting scripture is equally perspicuous on all issues like for example the perspicuity on scripture on the nephilim okay no one's defending that let's be real um but there is the idea paranormal of podcast i have <laughs> they go way to like okay this tenuous conclusion to this tenuous conclusion to this and then mm. you know uh throw in michael heiser's conclusions god rest his soul and then it's like 
okay, everything is disembodied uh, souls of the Nephilim. And I was like, uh, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. I understand. And and then and the saying is, is like uh, the, the perspicuity of scripture is about, is mainly about the, the, the big things, the necessary things. Yeah. What um, must I believe and or do to be saved? Basically, that's, that's what we argue that. What does it mean to be a Christian? How do I get right with God? That's that's where perspicuity lies. That's where we uh, argue. For it. And then others would likewise say, like, bottom line <laughs> issues of morality as well, at least the foundational principles for morality. We'd uh, a, a lot of people were probably saying the same, although the Protestant confessions don't touch that explicitly when it comes to perspicuity. Well, you see, Paul, um, scripture yeah. is obscure, but uh, I can discern from nature, like, like <laughs> all these natural wall <laughs> arguments. The scripture is very muddy, but the trees, just look at the trees. <laughs> if, if you look at the nature and stuff and you notice uh, homosexual penguins and. Um, <laughs> uh, it, and and what is it? Seahorses can change their sex or something. <laughs> right. And you're like, and then it becomes like, I'm not, I'm not dissing like using natural law. Right. Yeah. But yeah. then it's. Or, or like, oh, uh, we're, I guess we'll get into this. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. This is just the intro, but it's like, well, people disagree with each other. Therefore, yeah, perspicuity exactly. not real. And that's, it's like, uh -huh. that's like, a, well, that... there's polytheists and atheists. And in yeah. Romans 1, God said he communicated clearly his divine attributes through nature. So nature not Per perspicuity of theism debunked guys let's go yeah that's me... that's definitely great you touched on that that's what i was about to say that there that these attacks on pers on the perspicuity of scripture at least on the areas where we're claiming it's perspicuous um it utterly demolishes perspicuity for everything because if these if these very basic things which is they'll they'll often say oh well it's not clear because there's people who disagree they miss out on they ignore the factor of people having crap epistemologies and sometimes just straight up bad motives. They pretend that doesn't exist. Like to say something is not perspicuous is to say that you would have to demonstrate in my mind that there's people with the same right epistemology and they can't come to an agreement on, and, and both with good faith motives and they can't agree on a certain issue. That's when I think you can demonstrate that something really isn't clear. Um, second of all, um, what do you call it? Um, it, it, ex it extends to literally everything because as you say, you can point to nature, but then also, um, what will Rome point to as like the clear demonstrations of their own authority? Well, part of it will be scripture, but according to the apologetic scripture is not perspicuous. So they have to throw that out. The other one is the tradition of the church. So millions upon millions of pages of patristic texts, magisterial documents across two millennia. That's perspicuous. Well, or then, is, then you get to of, like, well, this guy said something, this guy said, uh, disagreed with something, and it's like, well, so yeah. it just becomes Rome summary, and then so then it becomes, uh, so then you got to go with Rome summary, which they haven't infallibly defined any Bible verses, and then and then you have, or maybe up to seven, Raymond Brown says zero. <coughs> yeah, that's right. And again, um, to make to. Just to make it clear for everybody, because I like to have my uh, Romanist friends in the chat as well and fans, um, this isn't an argument by all Romanists. I I'd argue that was one of Rome's key arguments in the Counter-Reformation, but otherwise, um, even the later Magisterium in certain documents and many other well-meaning and well-thought-out Romanists today will not try to argue with such skepticism against script Scripture's perspicuity, at least on certain key issues. So... This that this wouldn't be an attack on this dream overall isn't an attack on Romanism per se, but the public face of its apologetics right mm -hmm. now. That's that's kind of what we're aiming at. All um, right, and yeah, those are the things. so what do you want to start with? <clears throat> well, let's just go with the outline. Uh, I'll let you uh, lead. Yep, sure, sure. So the basic things I want to discuss tonight. Well, the first the first one is something that you want to talk about. So basically the kind of the kind of weaseling around with nicaea 2 the second council of nicaea is an yes. uh, uh, anathematization of those who do not venerate icons and not just those who oppose the practice but people who just refrain from venerating icons 
Um, and then also I want to look at, and, and we're not, we're not going to be doing any big depth in all these things. We're not going to be going into all the arguments and these things we want to look at and responding to them all. We just kind of want to, we want to ground our observations in these examples and kind of draw from that and then make our comments on it. Mm -hmm. Um, the other things we want to look at a bit of will include the debate between Trent Horn and Dr. Gavin Ortland. Um, Soul Scriptura. Yeah. The Soul Scriptura debate, uh, the debate review with Swan Sonner that Trent Horn had on his channel. Um, and also a little bit on Trent Horn's follow-up because I think that can really demonstrate a big inconsistency. Like it, it, it demonstrates a key example of when they appeal to skepticism at one point to suit their case, um, but then they give themselves the benefit of the doubt in being able to make some very tenuous inferential arguments for their case, like being very inconsistent basically. Uh, and then also even a, a little brief look at the new book literally titled the obscurity of scripture <laughs> which i've i've ordered a physical version it's coming uh should be here soon uh well i'm gonna let you read that. that well it's a, a very a uh, it's a very good thing that some catholic apologists out there decided to do what god could not which is to speak clearly for 350 pages and get his point across so i mean very good point catechumen look at these lutheran sodomites the bible isn't clear enough is not a good argument it's not no it's not because, um, again, as I mentioned before, something can be clear even if a lot of people believe otherwise because they have bad faith and or just a really crappy way of reading things. Um, you can think of a billion analogies as something where all normal-minded people would say, yeah, that's clear. Oh, can you uh, pull up the Bersulli's, uh, eight, uh the one 19 minutes after the hour? Uh, okay. The one exception to me ignoring him. If scripture is perspicuous, unless he reconciles sola fide with James 2, 24. Sure. Yeah, go yeah. to my channel, unless... look up the video, a harmonization of James and Paul with a little Aquinas uh, thrown in, I think, or something like that. Uh, it, it has something like that title. I go over it. I, I do a grammar lesson. Um, and uh, I even show how Aquinas, uh, uh, uh Although his view of justification isn't the reformer's view, his um, his harmonization is basically the reformer way of harmonizing it. Yep, that's right. So uh, I guess it's Basulis versus a doctor of his church. So that's boom be done, my man, Corey. Good to see you, King. Good to see you. Likewise, you, Samuel. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's start off with discussing the uh, the Nicaea to how they how they get around that. Do you want to play any clips from the? Trent Horn, Jimmy Aiken thing, or you just want to discuss it as? as no, nah, I just want to discuss it. And we kind of already <laughs> went over the meat of it. So just to recap, it's that <coughs> ecumenical councils. The only thing that is, um, the only thing that is uh, guaranteed to be infallible is the, the final decree. <laughs> and it'd be kind of like handing in the math homework and it's just like, all right, this step doesn't work, and this step doesn't work, and I and the teacher can't follow all your steps. But trust me, teacher, the answer is guaranteed. <coughs> right? Like that's how you why you make arguments. It's mm, implied yeah. in your arguments that the arguments will lead you to the conclusion. So if your argument is faulty, like you shouldn't be able to trust the argument. You could make a bad argument that is for something that's true, right? But mm. in terms of in, an infallible thing where it's like conclusion, you know, premises, conclusion, you know, argument and that sort of thing, it's like, yeah. I, that's where I said, like, if you, um, if you, um, uh, I think just to show that is enough. I, 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 I think for any reasonable person, I don't think we have to go further on the topic uh, with anyone who kind of holds that view. It's just like, well, uh, there you go. Like, what, what's the point of, of um, <coughs> excuse me, getting over cold. What's the, what's the, uh, what's the point of endlessly debating something? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And then, then they're going to make their own separate arguments uh, for something, 
Well, our, our, if I'm going to agree with your argument, like your conclusion isn't uh, guaranteed and you're, you know, if the ecumenical council's reasoning isn't guaranteed, your reasoning is not guaranteed. So like, what do you do? So I, sh I should take your reasoning like over an ecumenical council's reasoning, which you admit is flawed. So it would be like saying, so if you, if you look at scripture, right, there are some, diff, uh, especially since we're not first century Jews, we're looking at how they're using some Messianic texts or whatever. When I, when I encounter that, I try to get into their mindset and try to understand how the, the, the apostles are using that or whatever. Uh, but I don't go like, well, that was incorrect. They're using the Old Testament incorrectly, which some New Testament scholars will do. Uh, who yep. don't believe in uh, inerrancy or whatever? <clears throat> they're they're the apostles um, are misusing the Old Testament, but you know Jesus is still the Messiah because that's that's a guaranteed conclusion from the apostles. How, how's that going to work when you're like mm -hmm. evangelizing Jews or something? Yeah, exactly. Or, or talking to Muslims or something like that. Yeah, exactly. But, but we're, I'm supposed to be okay with uh, you know? Oh, I, oh, I have to. Uh, do I kind of do it's just an appeal to authority it's <clears throat> very arbitrary so <laughs> I shall oblige you Mr. Wilson because <clears throat> I swear the epistemology is just totally authoritarian because like they just want to give the answer they want to tell us to do all this crap but they won't actually give us the reasons like bro I'm not going to do stuff just because you tell me Wallah Habibi all right just tell me why I'll actually follow you Wallah <laughs> just oh I I, I uh, one more time for, and then we'll ignore him. The Brasulis, the 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 twenty two minutes. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah, you're. That's not what per uh, purpose. It doesn't. It doesn't mean you don't do work, yeah. or you don't have to put in effort. Hey, okay? this to this toddler isn't able to read. The apple fell from the tree. Therefore, it's not clear what it means at all. Oh, the horror. It yeah, yeah, you have to understand on the how page human doesn't language telepathically works. transport the meaning into his mind. Oh no, it's not clear. Oh man, oh man. Please, everyone, pray, pray for Basulis for his uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to have uh, to say his internal state and his clear learning delay. And I'm being unironic when I say that. I, I've said this in the past, and I mean this, and this is based on personal experience. Uh, like I'm, I'm, I don't want to mention my age, but like when I became a Christian about 30 years ago. Uh, over 30 years ago, <coughs> I read scripture. I read scripture prior to um, um, uh, converting. And um, uh, and it didn't make much sense to me. I never got like things that I read now. I'm like, well, that's perfectly clear. So I, I'm kind of wondering if, if a lot of people who believe in the obscurity of scripture or just uh unregenerate yeah yeah i'm at i'm at that stage as well not that like obviously we can grant there's a number of things scripture isn't clear on like the the biggest example i know of <clears throat> one of the big ones which actually very people little people talk about but there's the whole incident with zipporah um moses's wife and when the lord appears before the tent and she's like oh crap so she runs into the tent circumcises their son Moses comes and then she throws the, the, the foreskin before his feet and says, now you're a husband of blood. No one has a clue what that means. There are no contextual markers anywhere that we know of that actually shed light on that. My mom, she actually attends uh, Pentecostal biblical scholar conferences. And there was one where they did a session on that. And there was like 12 billion views on that passage because there's just it, it was all speculation no one has an idea what that means so there's demonstrably parts that are not clear um on the converse part when we look at the primary message of the holy scriptures like what do they want believers for all time to do we can argue yes that's very clear very demonstrably oh dominic's in the chat oh uh 20 uh, put the cat uh cumin ump don't uh, take which one? Uh, uh the one 26 minutes after don't take so oh, well, um no don't worry so do you want us to use pope francis <laughs> do you want us to use the representative of your religion as the representative of your religion <laughs> <laughs>
timing. Let's go, boys. Here, can you play that again? We'll use it occasionally. All right, all right. <laughs> I love that video. We're pulling, we're pulling your leg, Katakumi. We're pulling your leg. But yeah. <laughs> But yeah, lots, lots, lots of true, lots of um, very, very true stuff with that because I think that shows the the Nicaea two thing. That shows the double edged sword of perspicuity. Um, and and really, if we take the argument seriously about how oh, it's only the theological conclusions um, that uh, that are like infallibly guaranteed in the council, those are the only ones that are like binding irrevocably for all time. Um, when you read the second council of Nicaea's minutes and statements when they pass it around, is there any hint of that dichotomy of that nuance? Um, there, there really isn't. No. Um, this is something that <coughs> from the re- from the research, um, the little research I've done mainly, um, thanks to, uh, my boy Craig Trulia and his big research on this. Um, he, he basically showed that really the first person to ever outline this theory of ecumenical councils, that only their conclusions are binding was Anastasius, the librarian, like no one before him uh, outlined this idea. And it was, it was one of multiple ideas that he just threw out there in order to reconcile certain things of the councils with the authority of Rome, if my memory serves correctly. Um, and that's something that's going to be featured in his book, by the way, because he's actually making a papacy critique book right now. And uh, yeah, so get excited for that. Yeah, that would be um, interesting. He does. Um, he, even he's when I disagree to... with him, I, I think he does good work. He's like um, hit and uh, Wagner. I respect a lot on the uh, and I, I have to say, mm. even though we're going to rag on him a little, the uh, I really like Trent Horn. I've I did a video with him and uh, Steve Christie. Yeah, same, same. Um, um, I really like. Trenhorn, uh, but he's a really nice guy. But some of his arguments, man, and we like Swan too. So here, guys, right here, Samantha, biggest fan, right here. Let's uh, go. I think She's that's directed fire. towards me, but thank you, Samantha. Uh huh. Good. That, that, that's that's funny, Jeff. Anyway, welcome back to the other Paul boys, and it's going to be a solo show today. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, um, putting it back on this. Their theor- their theorization about the anathematizations not being something authoritative with the councils, like the decrees are. Um, when we just look at the decrees and like in 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 the context in which those anathematizations are coming out, it's part of a series of various bishops who are giving their confessions of faith before the council in order to affirm their own orthodoxy. And this is from the uh, those particular anathematizations. <coughs> Uh, I th- one of the sections where they anathematize people who just do, who just refrain from venerating icons that comes from the Bishop of Myra. I forgot his, I forgot his name. Um, but he basically said anathema to those who just do not venerate icons. So not even just those who oppose icon veneration, but those who just actively refrain from it. Um, and then the presiding Bishop over the council, Tarasius of Constantinople says, yes, this is the true faith. Okay. Next guy or something like that. Um, and so just, just by looking at that, it seems the council treats that confession as like representative of binding orthodoxy that even, um, just on a surface reading, uh, that even the, um, the refusal to venerate icons is binding. Um, and so just, just doing the basic thing back at them, and it doesn't even require skepticism or throwing out false ambiguity. That's a very real, reasonable, arguably the most reasonable reading of the text. Um, and we can say that, and even if we can grant even if we grant that Aiken and Horn's reading is technically allowable, technically true, that's certainly not perspicuous. That's only made perspicuous leagues later when the papacy eventually makes that claim. And so really, the by their own standards, the consequence of their worldview is that perspicuity is really only present, if even only tenuously, in the present magisterium. Yes. As as Which is, uh, apart, but would you... Does the present magisterium give any per you know clearness on anything does like at all? Does it like reestablish, like reinterpret everything as soon as a new pope comes in, so that it's fresh in people's minds and it's suddenly clear again? Because as soon as it goes into the past, it's it, liable. The, to the other thing is, is that they uh, the, these attacks are attacks against all texts whatsoever. They're not just yeah, attacks yeah. on scripture or ecumenical councils or. 
or just religious mm-hmm. texts, but it's, it's, it's really like, so when I, I was raised Catholic, but I, 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 you know, um, I'm in, you know, America. So the amount of like trads are like what, 5% or something, or if that, or at least we're in my neck of the woods. So, um, uh, to me, so I started doing, you know, I probably interacted with Jews and atheists most. And then when I started getting into Catholic stuff, I was like, wow, it really is a mixture of like postmodernism and uh, uh, Catholic apologetics was really a lot of like appeals to authority that I saw in Jewish apologetics. And, um, also a lot of uh postmodernism uh where like mm. these attack the text sort of thing the clearness of the text so yeah. to me i was never <coughs> when that's my first experience with like a uh like a a conservative defense apologetic um uh catholicism never really held any um any appeal to me those arguments didn't really hold an appeal to me yeah very another banger by a foo we should be clear about what it means for the magisterium to interpret the magisterium doesn't interpret anything in the sense of exegesis i I, i'd I'd argue that it does like at very rare small points um but otherwise yes the magisterium can't tell us what azazel means i I, i'd 100 agree with that um because very the vast majority of the time the interpretation that the magisterium does is not by means of infallibly exegeting these texts because they'll even admit that could the the bases upon which the decisions are made are fallible they can be in error and there's a number of them which in which that can be demonstrated um but it's rather the conclusions they just give the conclusions so technically they don't really interpret anything they give you the conclusions and for a large part, it's up to you, the individual believer, to see how that fits with the scriptures and past. Well, documents. that's why I thought uh, Ortland was wise to mention the death penalty in his debate. I thought that was a good point. Yeah, was that it was very clear that the the death penalty was allowed and now is not allowed, and uh, they wanted to point to slavery or something like that, which would get me in hot water. Where I'm like, well, I don't think if slavery is not banned by scripture, it's not. Banned. It's not, no. Uh, Band stealing is, but that was know. a moment in the debate. I just wish all the <coughs> ironic, um, and to be respectful, normie. Um, because if I was in his position, like, what does the Bible say about slavery? I'd just say it's not wrong. Next, <laughs> I, mean, I just, I just drop it. I just it's drop not. It. I mean, it's not like in itself. Like to use the language that Romanists will say about the death penalty. Um, Pope Francis isn't saying that it isn't inherently immoral, just that certain context may go around it. I'd say the exact same thing around slavery. It's not inherently evil. I can grant it's a consequence of the fall and it will be done away with in the new kingdom. Yes. But it's not inherently evil because there may be situations where it's actually necessary and a good in that sense. Yeah. And uh, I do want to mention the, the, the death penalty when we get into, Oh, the chaos of soul scriptura and the consequences and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Maybe we should move on from, is there anything else we should go on with, with Nicaea two or. Um, no, I think that's good. Just to wrap up our overall conclusions um, that, <clears throat> Overall conclusions that attacking perspicuity of scripture, um, when you suddenly get to these thorny issues where they have to do these very, um, these very creative reinterpretations of past documents, uh, that kind of throws them for a loop logically and argumentatively speaking. Um, they do, they, they, they expose themselves for all sorts of like two coke ways. Like, uh, what about you guys, you know? And I'm okay with what about you guide the two cook way, like because yeah. I don't find that as a logical fallacy. It's just saying yeah, like you need to be that. consistent in your argument with me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What do you what are you saying, Christian, about my monkeys? What about my monkeys? Far out. You're you're probably just looking at Basules. He's one of your monkeys, mate. <laughs> not not his monkeys, not a circus. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
No, my boys in my chat, my boys, my fellow prots, and even my um, even my fellow papists and Easterners in the chat who are my fans and they're good guys. None of them are monkeys. They're all heckin' based and epic. Hey, Stefan, good to see you. Agreed, Mr. Kebab. They all need more kebabs. Um, yeah, I reckon we move on to the overview, um, look at the debate with respect to this issue of like perspicuity and that. Yeah, or more Robert some things that were deployed. I don't want to... We're not going yeah. over the, the whole thing. Yeah, we're not going to go over the whole thing. No, yeah. Um, so, yeah, give us your take <coughs> on the debate with respect to what we're looking at tonight. Uh, uh, did you hear me? Uh, what did you say? Oh, give us, give us like your takes on the debate with respect to this issue we're looking at. Um, okay. I thought, I mean, Trent mentioned stuff about canon and textual criticism where. To me, it was like, it's kind of that skeptical appeal. But I thought for, especially in the Q&A, and he mentioned this with Swan, he wanted to show the consequences of Sol Scriptura. And to me, it's the, uh, uh, me and Dominic uh, Fu need to come to a conclusion of what to call it. But I'm going with what one of my viewers in the past called it, is the safety net syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you got to figure stuff out. And oh, like who who's there to adjudicate? And oh, uh, everything's so chaotic. Ah. And then it's like <laughs> when you have Rome, and it's like that's just it. The question is not like I think there's an assumption there, like God would never let us like be in a uh, wh however chaotic you want to view it as some sort of chaotic situation. <coughs> well, he has. And um, it more is like it would be none of these. It would be fitting or, you know, any of these sort of arguments is like we can see what God has done through history. And we should we should focus on like our our actual situation as opposed to, well, <clears throat> it's all so chaotic. And so then therefore Rome, it's like. And I know that's not like the official, uh, that's not an, a, a, like an official argument or anything, but that's definitely a, a pop a, apologetic argument. Yeah. <coughs> that really needs to die. Yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed that a lot in the Q and a when a lot of horns Q and a was basically doctrinal tests like, Hey, Orland, uh, can you tell us where scripture defines this doctrine or that doctrine? Or even the gospel, you know, that that was the really bizarre one when he's like, oh, nowhere in scripture does it define the gospel. I mean, like, I, I, seriously? I mean, it doesn't give a scholastic type, exhaustive, precise proposition that is definitional of the gospel, but it defines it everywhere by constant reference and use in various different contexts, which do make it very clear what the gospel is. Um, so that, that was weird. But anyway, yeah, the all these doctrinal tests that came off as a really big attempt at a gotcha, like, oh, look, you can't get this uh, popularly considered important doctrine from scripture, therefore sola scriptura bad, which wouldn't actually follow. Because like, let's say I could have, if I was sitting in that debate, I'd just say, okay, I'm going to grant your argument. Um, we can't demonstrate the Trinity from scripture. Okay. Um, in that case, the Trinity is not binding. And now you have to tell me why I must be a Trinitarian if scripture doesn't require it. So I just, I do, I just kind of throw it back because for him to say that's a problem, he kind of has to beg the question, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and I also thought they had, uh, Trent had problems, um, thinking outside of his own paradigm. Like, well, what about baptism or infant baptism? And I'm a Presbyterian, you're an Anglican. So I believe in infant baptism is the way to go. But, um, in my paradigm, our church doesn't make a Baptist heretical in terms of outside the faith. Mm -hmm. So for me to be like, well, okay, it, it's something you can disagree on. It's not unimportant, but like it's essential to your paradigm, but it's not essential over. It doesn't mean it's, it's actually essential, if that makes sense. So yeah. it was like, oh, it's it's something they took something from within their paradigm 
that they view as incredibly essential <coughs> and then try to use that as a gotcha. And I was like, no, you know? Yep. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent true with that. Um, okay. Now I want to look at one of the clips from the debate, which I found very interesting because later on, I'm going to contrast that. Um, actually I might, I might even just do it all. I'll, I'll do it later, but I'm going to, show the clip now from the debate one that was very that really piqued my interest when it when it happened when i was watching live and i'm going to contrast it with another clip trent horn posted right after the debate although he actually recorded before the debate from his thing on the earliest church fathers allegedly not believing the new testament with scripture um so i'm going to share my screen right now because <clears throat> this was a very enli uh, enlightening interaction and all in asking this question, he hit the money on the head, and I think he drew the best answer from uh, Trent Horn. So uh, let us listen. This is at the heart of it. Where does the New Testament ever envision post-apostolic infallibility as an ongoing feature of the church? And I'm emphasizing the adjective post-apostolic. The same place where it envisions a particular collection of writings, infallible writings, as the authority of the church. That okay, so first part... <laughs> Very, in, very interesting because Horn's whole argument is that scripture nowhere says there's going to be a particular uh, set of books that will be authoritative for the church. That's his argument. That's what he establishes earlier. So if his answer to the, his, so the question is, where does scripture say there will be a post apostolic magisterium, infallible magisterium? And his answer is the same place where it says there's going to be a set uh, canon of books that'll be authoritative. So nowhere? So scripture nowhere affirms that there will be a post-apostolic magisterium. And he, he, he That's kind not of how we, uh, Catholics have traditionally argued. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's going to, um, the, the, his answer kind of develops what he means here and it gets very interesting. Oh, can I, can I mention some, uh, before you continue? Yep. Is that, um, I could have sworn early in the debate, like, uh, Trent Horn argued uh, mentioned he supported material sufficiency and then later in the debate he kept arguing for basically a de facto part and part view yeah and i was very confused by that so yeah and that that i think points to the incoherence of the very idea of material sufficiency with respect to text and i'll get onto that later we'll just finish this where that the idea that well wait so your question so i would say that one if you interpreted it strictly well, no, it does. It doesn't talk about really any kind of post-apostolic authority, whether it's written or unwritten. If you read it strictly, what about Ephesians four? There's there's offices in the church mentioned all over the New Testament. First Timothy three, they're all over. There's just none that are infallible that I'm aware of. But what I would say is you would apply the same thing that the that the New Testament does not say there will be a collection of infallible writings that will serve as the authority of the church. And I think what I would say then, if we didn't read it as strictly. I would say there are scripture passages that talk about the role of the Listen. church, like First Timothy three fifteen. The church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of truth. Matthew sixteen eighteen. The church, uh, the the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So if the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that would seem to imply the church will never formally succumb to some kind of heresy. Okay, fair enough. So so would seem to imply. You, I, I when he first said that, I caught that immediately i hope others did but i'm just going to emphasize it now so everyone knows that doesn't sound awfully certain would seem to imply a it's kind of it's a, a kind of trifecta of less than solid inferences well the would so um a sort of uh what's what's some called like an optative mood like this would happen which is inferential in nature seem so something appears to be the case but may not necessarily be the case uh to imply so it's not direct it's not explicit but it kind of implies it that that's very very shaky so horn appears to kind of admit indirectly that his case for a post-apostolic magisterium in scripture is based on some very, shall we say, I mean, he, he, he probably, he probably would say that they're the best inferences, but just from how he's, how he's expressing it here. It doesn't seem um, very strong. 
that doesn't seem very strong. He doesn't seem entirely confident in it either, in, in the strength of his own arguments, at least at this point. So if you um, could look and, at and history, yet, and right? Yet that's the, the, and yet something that would seem to imply something seems to, in this case, be sufficient for demonstrating it as reality, as an established reality. So, and when you put that up against the skepticism that he employs everywhere else, and, and especially other Catholic apologists, oh man, um, with respect to Scripture's perspicuity, Sol Scriptura, whether the fathers believe certain arguments, they would not, when you, if you were to say, oh, well, um, Augustine's statement would seem to imply that he believed in Sola Scriptura, they would rightly laugh at that. Like, you don't, you are not confident in your own case if someone said that. And, and that's why I'd say, no, Augustine definitely preached Sola well, Scriptura. I wouldn't even say would seem to imply. How, um, how would you establish yeah. it then by, like, uh, if, the, if Trent goes to an appeal to, like, we can look at history, then, yeah, we can look at history. And I'm saying, like, oh, hey, you know, Trent, uh, Council of Trent, um, uh, erred on justification. Uh, Nicaea too. We've already gone over the mistakes there. So, wouldn't that lead me to believe that, like, yeah, the church isn't infallible? Uh, and then, yeah. like, how do you define the church? Like, oh, like, they're defining the church as any anyone in communion with the Pope, really. So, mm. uh, so if parts of the church fall away, like that's not, you know, it, it, it's kind of like a, like anybody, it, it becomes whoever agrees with me, agrees with me. Mm. Um, um, sort of claim. And that's yep. not really that impressive. If that makes sense. It, it's not, it, it's really not. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll just jump to it right now. So I'll just, I'll just skip the order. I want to jump to his presentation um, that he posted after the debate um, on the earliest church fathers allegedly not believing that scripture was, uh, the, the New Testament rather, was authoritative scripture. Um, specifically the section on the epistle of Barnabas. And I'm just going to read, uh, we're going to listen through a bunch of that. <clears throat> um, and to put it quickly, I was supposed to be with Father James in his response to it. Um, but I wasn't, unfortunately, because of other issues, I wasn't prepped for it. So I had to cancel joining him. So we will be doing a part two. Uh, he will be doing a part two on his channel where I'll be joining him and giving my critiques in particular on this section on the Epistle of Barnabas. So I'm going to save my critiques of his case here and just focus on the standards of evidence he, he wants here. So for context, watch it, people. Um, love you, Horn. But my word, you sound like an atheist in this video. You really, really do. If we just, you mean if, like we, an atheist? if we just ignore the fact that you are Trent Horn, the Roman Catholic apologist, or well, technically if you go to a Byzantine liturgy, I think. Um, but anyway, um, and if you just tone down your statements about the authority of the church a little bit, I could mistake you for an atheist in this video. I really could. Like it, it really, um, he really falls for his own a Protestants argue like atheist thing in this video. And so I just kind of want to, I just want to focus on that bit in this, on, on that tactic, on that standard in this uh, part. I'm not going to give the critique here. I'll save that for my um, collab with Father James. So we'll just listen here. Hypothesize and contains allegorical descriptions of the New Testament and of Jesus times all throughout the document. There are nine references to the Old Testament of Scripture. Well, 13, if you include the Old Testament of Scripture. One reference to the Book of Enoch as a... Uh, Acts 14.22, uh, the saying there, it, it seems to be attributed to Jesus. It's not called sacred scripture. It may formally cite Matthew 22.14. Once again, this is a little, this is another ambiguous one. The only Pay case, attention. And we'll see this, by the way. I've read, it might be in Metzger, I'm not sure, but I've read Protestants who say, oh, well, the earliest church fathers believed that the discussion at the New Testament Barnabas says here, uh, so great signs and wonders were wrought in Israel. Uh, they were thus at length abandoned. Lest us beware, lest we be found fulfilling the saying, as it is written, many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, the only place you find that is in Matthew twenty-two fourteen, where Jesus is telling a parable about uh, the person invited to the banquet. He doesn't have his garment. 
it's, it's an allegory, a parable about how if you're not in, united to Christ, you will be thrown out. You'll be thrown. You'll you'll be damned. You'll be in. You'll be in hell. Really quickly, pay attention to this. So that text very explicitly says, "As it is written," and then quotes a statement verbatim from the Gospel of Matthew. And I mean verbatim, mm -hmm. not just an English translation. I actually checked the Greek. It is verbatim, except for the uh, for the particle gar. Uh, gar, which means for, so like you're giving a reason for something for many are cho called, but few are chosen. Um, but that is inconsequential because <laughs> that, that is flowing on from another part. So it's perfectly reasonable for one or so words to drop out that that's perfectly normal in quotations and citations of texts in the ancient world. And it, even in the modern world, we do this all the time. We'll uh, consciously or subconsciously drop off a word, word or two in order to make it make a slightly better sense. Um, either way, though, it's talking about something that's written. It's a text. And again, I checked the Greek. You can check it for, you, uh, for yourself. And if anyone wants to uh, wants me to give them the, the Greek from the Epistle of Barnabas to check for themselves, I can do that later. Um, and it's verbatim. Okay, so it is a verbatim quote of the passage in Matthew. So something that is so it's well beyond would seem to imply it is in your face red alarms clear that it's citing the Gospel of Matthew. Now, so it goes well beyond Trent's own standard of acceptable arguments that he established in the debate. He is willing to accept arguments from things that would seem to imply a certain conclusion. And yet when he gets to hear when something is very clear, very, very clear, very obvious, at least on a face value reading, that it's citing the Gospel of Matthew, here's how he treats it. Cast out into the outer darkness, men gnash their teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So this is what the character in the parable says that Jesus is telling. And so Barnabas may be quoting it here, but once again, this is a little bit odd. Uh, Barnabas quotes Jesus, the, the epistle of Barnabas quotes Jesus and says, uh, as the Lord said, or as the Lord spoke, but here he, he doesn't do that. He just says, uh, for the, the, for it is written. And this may be all of this, including what Jesus is saying here for many are called, but few are chosen. They all just might be referencing an older Jewish proverb related to the old Testament. There's something similar in four Ezra a three. There be many created, but few shall be delivered. That's why Jonathan Lukadu, in his major commentary on Barnabas, probably one of the most recent major commentaries on the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, he says, it is difficult to adduce clear examples of New Testament quotations within the Epistle of Barnabas. Given the small amount of possible Matthean or synoptic materials elsewhere in the letter, it is difficult to argue with a high degree of certainty for a literary relationship between Barnabas and the canonical Gospels. Though, uh, so I'm going to add a question mark there, but I could see how many people would see that Barnabas is quoting Matthew 22, 14 as scripture, but it still seems uh, ambiguous to me. And other scholars do recognize that. Uh, uh, it's an exact quotation. Yeah. So <clears throat> I am trying my darndest. Um, Holy Spirit, don't let me spill everything i'm trying my darndest not to just go what the heck and just refute it all here again future show with father james stay tuned um just notice the night and day difference in standards he is willing to base his faith at least in part with respect to evidences from scripture on something on something that on passages that would seem to imply his conclusion because at least he admits that they're not explicit about a post-apostolic magisterium. So that, that that's cool. I'm glad he did that. But then when you get something that is on its face, very explicit, and there is no other evidence, no other text, no other candidate text that comes even close to being a potential citation, he is willing to give um, another text for Ezra or some unknown jewish proverb out in the wind um borderline equal weight with a text that has the statement verbatim from from the same socio-religious context and near contemporary context as the epistle of barnabas 
do we see the night and day difference in standards here? That, that, that is, I think, a really big and beautiful summary of the selectivity of the pop Romanist um, skeptical paradigm. It is rules for thee, but not for me. You have to jump this massive bar of skepticism of like, oh, well, it could be this, it could be that. And as long as there's even a remote possibility that it could be something else, therefore, boom, prot's wrong. They can't establish their case. But for them, it only at best merely requires the preponderance of evidence, like 51% for them to establish their case, if even that. I don't I don't know what much else to say there. I'll give you the floor, Jeff. I no, I think uh, just showing the inconsistency is enough. And and that's kind yeah. of like the point of the stream. Yeah. It's yeah. like what, what you know. What are you gonna do? Yeah, 100 percent My dude, my MFM, thank you so much for that super chat. Won't be watching the stream tonight, but keep up the good work, mate. Thank you very much, King. Thank you so much for that super chat. Uh God willing, yes, I will keep up that good work. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, wow. Um, anything more about the debate no. you want to mention, Jeff? Or? Um, oh, for the debate in general? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you, uh, queue up the video I have of, um, uh, of, uh, Trent Horn accepting the burden of proof? Um, is this in the debate itself or? Oh no. Remember the, uh, clip I sent you it starts around minute two. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. All YouTube, right. Trenhorn about to uh, accept the burden of proof. I want to discuss this for a little bit. Oh, here it is. Oh, no. Dracula uh, exposed the sunlight. Oh, there's the burden of proof. Ah! Oh no, he has to prove there's something besides scripture that's infallible. Ah! Oh, I have to point to at least one thing that came from an apostle. Ah! Okay. Ah, oh, poor Trent Horn. <laughs> that's some grade A boomer humor there. <laughs> To, to me, like <clears throat> when he he was like, "Oh well, I don't have to. You have to prove a universal negative." I'm like, "You you you have to prove there's a paradigm shift." <laughs> like, really? He has to prove. Uh, like, Gavin had to prove there was a universal negative. I mean, like, look, <laughs> in fairness, um. Even though it is technically the traditional way debates are, um, I don't like how the affirmative alone is expected to have the burden of proof and that the other side just has to um, confute the other side's case. I, I don't like that inequality. I like to just think, like with real argument, everyone who has a claim, positive or negative, has to prove it. You believe Sol Scriptura is true, prove it. You believe it's not true, prove it. Because if neither side can... If, if you can refute someone who proves Sol Scriptura but you can't demonstrate your own opposite theory that will just leave us an agnosticism on the issue. So technically he does have the burden of proof in this debate, traditionally speaking, but I just do not like that at all. Well, how, um, how would you, uh, yeah. how, what's the easiest way to negate soul scriptura? Just show something yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I'm this sure. is when I, I have a problem here with um, uh, how uh, a lot of Catholics argue on this. Yeah. Is that they would say, oh, it's internally consistent, right? I don't think Trent didn't really argue that way on here, but he just, mm -hmm. but he just, and all he did was go with the burden of proof thing. Like, uh, it's yeah. like, that's uh, okay. That's a technical way of, of doing the debate, but are, are, are you're actually concerned about souls or are you care, care, concerned about like 
the the technicalities of the oh, right. <coughs> oh oh well you didn't you didn't prove there was not a teacup on the far side of the moon <laughs> like <laughs> like Gavin has to like you know it has to yeah. prove that's not there yeah right yeah, exactly. like okay or or it was, he's so concerned about not arguing like atheists right well and he mentions in his follow-up a swan like well it would be like an atheist saying um hey uh uh prove there's something beside we both agree there's the natural world right prove yeah. that there's something supernatural <coughs> we're outside of this world and um uh well in that famous um who was the presuppositional guy van Til? no bonson? uh the bonson that the famous debate where he's like oh um uh you know prove something that there's something immaterial well the laws of logic <laughs> there you go boom like i don't mind an atheist asking for evidence of something that is perfectly fair. Yeah. That's yeah. a perfectly fair thing for an atheist to do and be like, oh, you're arguing like an atheist. It's like, yeah, like if you're going to say there's a God, you need to like, I think it's fair for an for an atheist to ask, like what evidence do you have? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's not, that doesn't mean that we accept the, the common atheistic David Hume type presupposition that it must be deductive proof of some kind. You know, we, we believe in much more expansive kinds of proof things that cohere together like the best like abductive reasoning and all that stuff or, we're not, we're saying, or but... evidence and stuff like yeah. i'm not i'm not the one where it's like whoa you didn't prove it mathematically it's not yeah you know uh uh and yep uh, uh that that sort of thing uh but to me and i'm fine with presuppositional arguments and and evidential arguments and 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 that sort of thing but I, I, I think <coughs> in terms of Sola Scriptura, is it really that hard to disprove Sola Scriptura <clears throat> by just saying, here is something that's infallible? And then uh, I think they also mentioned like, well, they mentioned the, yeah, uh, with, with Swan, uh, Trent mentioned like, oh, well, they, they named the, uh, the magicians in Egypt. Now, I'm not sure if they're just using the names from... I don't believe any oral tradition uh, survived, uh, especially when you, you see it was a Josiah or whatever discovering the uh, the Torah, right? If they forgot yeah, about yeah, the yeah. written contents of the Torah... Yeah, exactly. That, that was on, I was on um, Alan Rule's channel a little bit ago where it was just like debunking the oral law, and that was like the key thing. Like, we point to that text, they forgot Passover because they didn't have the text. There was no oral law that kept it there, even though the Passover is a big section of the Mishnah, which is allegedly like the, the written, um, the written stage of the oral law. So that, that alone just, I, so I don't idea. think, uh, so there's two things to be said there. Um, so just because they know the name of the magicians, <clears throat> uh, or, or they, use, uh, Paul used the name of magicians. He might've just been like, this is a common Jewish, midrash where they gave him some names so we're just going to use it that doesn't mean paul thought it was li literally their names it was like an article of faith proven by some random oral thing you know right or even but if they do if it was an uh, an oral tradition that was preserved the only reason why we have any reason to think it's true is because it's written down in the new testament yeah yeah. Okay. Because right. if if you just went into the Talmud and you said, "Hey, the Egyptian magician names are X, Y, and Z," you would be like, "Okay, yeah, sure," or <laughs> like whatever. Okay. Um. So I think that shows that oral tradition is not infallible. And even if you do find one thing that's true, that doesn't make it infallible. Something being true is not the same thing as infallible. Mm -hmm. uh, or something that, like, mm -hmm. I know George Washington was the first president of the United States and that Australia is founded by a bunch of criminals or, you know, whatever, whatever you know. Yeah, radio, mate. Like, radio. <laughs> yeah, or I know about the Magna Carta. I don't yeah. have an infallible tradition of the Magna Carta. So yeah. even if something survives, uh, like the presence of 
incorrect oral traditions kind of shows that method of yeah of of uh that method is, of oral tradition is is not infallible and that's why they wrote stuff down even the jews yeah. started to write stuff down because yeah. they wanted it to be preserved and the only yeah, thing we exactly. know infallibly is really from the scriptures yeah precisely yeah um and, and what's funny i i just thought of this now if you go back to <clears throat> the common response the common interpretation of ecumenical councils by um aiken and horn in their response to orland's iconodulia stuff um, and even just more generally, um, when Romanists speak of like the ecumenical councils, they'll say that ecumenical councils, they can get historical details wrong. Um, that, that's fine because the tradition has to do with like the faith, like the articles of faith and that itself. So even if Second Council of Nicaea used forgeries or this Pope did or that, or if they got this historical detail wrong, that doesn't matter. Um, where does the names of the Egyptian priests fall under? That's not an article of faith. That's a little historical detail. And so by their own standard, that's a fallible tradition. So how can that even get them one step to demonstrating the thing which they are claiming contradicts Sol Scriptura? Because don't forget, Sol Scriptura doesn't deny reliable or even important, even important tradition that's reliable, even if not infallible. Right. It denies that there is an alleged extra biblical set of content that is unwritten that is unerring and infallibly promulgated by certain church councils or bodies or what have you um and according to their own standard that doesn't include minor historical details and what are the names of the egyptian priests if not a completely un unimportant historical detail so pointing to that doesn't show even like the smallest step for their case at all yeah it, I, I think there's stuff like that where and they also point to the the rock that followed around israel it was christ um where uh paul appealing to midrash i don't think in, implies that he he thought the midrash was yeah yeah true in the sense of happened in history yeah, or, um, or, or I don't think we can infallible. ascertain that. Let alone infallible. And of course, Romanists would have to, that would kneecap their argument as well, because Romanists have to affirm the Midrash is definitely not infallible, let alone authoritative. Yeah, right. The, the Midrash itself. So the only, even if you thought those two things did actually happen in history, the rock actually moved around with Israel, and those yeah. were the actual names, the, all the other oral traditions aren't, uh basically paul would have basically used his uh charisma of the holy spirit to kind of pick the two yeah. that were true and put them in scripture and we only know we only have any inkling that they might have happened in history because he picked them and put them in scripture yeah because yeah, exactly. do we have any oral traditions from the apostles about anything else in uh uh jewish midrash or Jewish oral traditions where they can pick and choose what's true? Or do we only have what's actually in the New Testament? We only have what's in the New Testament. <coughs> and Which I think kind of highlights uh, Gavin's point. Was that the only thing we have today that's infallible since the last apostle died. I I did not. Um, it, we're in a different position. If, if you actually heard the apostles preach live, that's different than than uh me who are 20 centuries later yeah 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 exactly exactly um i else to say about that or about the debate or no um well let's see uh do we want to go over the second peter thing yeah yeah 100 that's gonna be oh man that's that's gonna be fun um <clears throat> so i want to look at a specific clip um I remember exactly where I was in my workplace, what I was doing, where I was standing when I was listening to this exact point in the debate review. So Swan Sonna and Trent Horn debate review um, on Trent Horn's channel. Um, and when I heard this exact part and when Horn said the key thing, which you guys will know what it is when it comes, um, I literally just stopped what I was doing, stood still with my jaw open, like, like full on soy jack mode. Like what the heck did he just say? What? Um, and God willing, I have the right clip. I'm pretty certain I do. Cause it was like the, I did the word finding thing in that. So it should be, um, but this is it. 
Yeah. The most critical scholars will say, yeah, there's only about like you're quoting second Timothy three 16. Most critical scholars say Paul didn't write that letter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of them deny that Paul wrote the pastorals. Mm -hmm. and, and, re and really quickly, Ortland didn't, he never did give this uh, carte blanche authority to critical scholars. So that's not his argument here. He appeals to evidence. He'll, he'll cite scholars, but he'll appeal to the evidence they use. So that's the, the evidence, point. you know, the scholars, when we mention scholars, we mentioned like, because they like when we mentioned the like, uh, Hey, all, all these Catholic uh, historians don't believe in an early papacy. It's because like we agree with their assessment of the data not yeah. because they're, you know, yeah. So on and so forth. All right. So, you know, but you're, but you're not, and especially second Peter, right. Uh, you only have like people like Michael Kruger and others who will really vigorously argue for that. Now we as Catholics can say, well, we can believe these are infallible. They are inspired because the church has shown us that they can have this authority, even if they don't have direct apostolic yeah. authorship, because we're not tying oh. it to it's say, say oh, totally. it, well, it belongs in the canon can. if it's apostolic mm. and it's this and it's that. Well, we have it because of the tradition that's mm. received. Mm. And so. Uh, uh, uh. So we're not getting the canon necessarily because it's apostolic, but it's the tradition that was received. Oh, the New Catholic if Encyclopedia says... If it's not apostolic, it's not tradition. where did you receive... Where did that tradition come from if it wasn't apostolic? Mm. It's a tradition from the point they established the canon because the New Catholic Encyclopedia agrees that the canon, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, is not handed down from the apostles. Mm. Okay? Mm. So, yep. uh, contra some other... Apollo, the the um, blanking on his name does all the apocrypha work. Uh oh, who's that guy's name? I don't remember. <coughs> Steve would know. He has the apocrypha apocalypse uh, channel. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but the that it's okay. So you have um a tradition, you know. So I think they might be equivocating on tradition. Uh, when I think of tradition in this sense, I'm thinking like something that was handed down from the apostles. Mm -hmm. The canon is not that. The canon yeah. is really not what, revelation. Really what all the church fathers, all the church fathers, believe what authentic tradition was that which came from the apostles, not from the ether, and then somehow making its way into the stream. Right. So the canon is not technically a tradition. Now, if they want to say the church made it a pronouncement at some point in time and then passed it on and it's a tradition in that sense uh that thing but the 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 bigger problem here is that yeah uh the guy who wrote uh second peter is a liar <laughs> and <laughs> it's okay because the church said it's scripture man and this is what my problem was when uh, when Steve Christie and I critiqued uh, Trent Horn on the Apocrypha well, mm. on, on our uh, review of his debate. Mm. How on earth can you, <coughs> how on earth can, you know, it's like, ah, well, the Apocrypha might be pious fiction. And when it was, uh, uh, when it was canonized, people thought those books were history, but whatevs. You know, and, and I think that's part of uh, where we're going with that. It's like you just have to show the inconsistency here. Uh, it, like, what, what if if scripture can lie to you? Uh, and I guess God, it can be a liar, I guess. Like, this is to me, like, what's the point of debating the Apocrypha or like errors in scripture in general? Because <laughs> like, what's this scripture actually mean? Because, like, to me, like, it's like, well, debating whether the Apocrypha is Scripture or not, to them just means whether the church made a pronouncement. Mm. It, to me, it means, does do these books act are actually inspired by God, free from mm. error, and, and that sort of thing? And if their view of Scripture allows for errors, allows for lies, and it's re what's really important is, is, and then maybe they say, oh, they do say, oh, it's infallible. Like, can we cut the, through something here? Modern Rome doesn't believe in the infallibility of Scripture. Uh, they, there's a truck-sized hole you can drive through 
which is called the faith and morals clause, right? Like where <laughs> it's like, oh, it's it's everything, you know, good and consequence uh, for faith and morals, which means all the historical details can be wrong. <coughs> so, so when we're arguing the apocrypha, what's the point? I mean, what's the point? Because it's like we don't even agree on the nature of scripture. Like scripture to them just means something that's a pronouncement. And uh, this is why, like, I don't feel the need to debate. Uh, well, I guess I do. But, like, I think justification by faith alone is an essential. And it's important. But when what's the point of debating that with a Catholic when they, uh, when most of their magisterium and, like, post-Vatican II, like, you know, Jews can be saved, Muslims can be saved. Like, you don't even have the justification by faith part being an essential, let alone the alone part. So why am I debating sola fide with you? All right? Like, the trads are, like, I'm, I, okay, so maybe I might debate a trad, but I'm not actually debating the Roman Catholic position when I'm debating a trad. I mean, I might be debating a position from 1600, but that's not the Roman position today. So... Um, I mean, could you imagine going back 200, 300 years and talking to a Roman cat, a serious Roman Catholic and being <laughs> like, yeah, second Peter, you know, it doesn't matter if it was actually written by Peter because it says in there that he is, is written by Peter. So if it's not written by Peter, it shouldn't be in the canon. It's a mistake. Now that might mean that it gets thrown out of the canon and the other books are okay. But what it means is, like, if you're okay with Second Peter lying, okay, the author lying and it being in Scripture, your view of Scripture, what, like, we, we have more fundamental things to cover, which mm, is yeah. your, your view of Scripture is, is it, we don't have the yeah. same view of what constitutes Scripture, if any yeah. error-filled thing can get in. I'll, I'll, I'll be completely 100% transparent. I've toyed with the idea of the infallibility being specifically with respect to faith and morals and not necessarily every historical detail. Um, the problem comes in when it comes to historical details that actually ground doctrine. So like <coughs> if, if, if for example, um, there was like a list of in like numbers or whatever, like, um, and there were 30,000 soldiers that day, but Oh no, there was actually 29,000. Oh, the horror. Whatever. Um, that for me, well, it also um, comes down to authorial attention in the original audience. Exactly, right? yeah, because because even even then, alleged historical errors. There's actually issues of genre. It doesn't necessarily mean it's actually an historical and error. and of the time, like if, exactly, and of the time and all that. Yeah. Um, the issue I don't want to be so it, hyper woodenly literal, but exactly, yeah. The, but the that's issue much comes different with, than the guy saying hmm. I'm not. You know, someone in the day if it was a common practice and every in the original audience would understand the practice yeah exactly and it's not like uh woodenly literally like there's, thirty thousand troops or something and there's whole libraries of things on genre debates and, and it really becomes fascinating it actually alleviates just how massive and complicated these debates are it actually alleviates a lot of the pressure that some laymen may feel with alleged historical attacks in the bible just because there's so many layers of like genre and authorial intent that doesn't require strict historical well like, then it gets to be a point the of the like let's figure with, it out the the issue comes with when things when certain historical propositions are made as like literal historical propositions are made as the foundation for something in terms of faith and morals because you can't have an absolute there's, there's not a dichotomy of faith and morals versus history so the idea of second peter being authored by peter that is the basis upon which the authority of that letter does lay. If if we took that out and it was just like, hey, Joe from the mechanic next door, I'm sending you this letter. Um, and I'm okay, going to say I'm have, Peter. It may, maybe, maybe I'll listen to him. Maybe I'll hear him out. He has some good points. That's not going to convey itself with the same authority as Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So actually, yes, the authority of that letter does rest on the historical facticity of its authorship, it, it, it can't not. Otherwise, to say to say otherwise is literally to vi violate the First Vatican Council, which says that the Church does not create Scripture; it recognizes it. 
And if you're saying that the very foundation upon which the letter itself lays, uh, lays for itself, the, the authorship of Peter, where is it being drawn from? Where's it coming from? The ether. That's, that's basically what it is. Now to me, like, uh, you don't want to go so far the other way where you're like, well, it doesn't matter if like Nebuchadnezzar actually destroyed uh, Jerusalem. No, 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 Right? Like if it was, if we found out Nebuchadnezzar never had anything to do with Jerusalem, <coughs> we got some major problems on our hands yeah. with uh, like, yeah. uh, and, and let's say the Jews never went into the Babylonian captivity. You got to yeah, throw we, out like a ton of scripture. We couldn't, we couldn't cope our way around that. We have to be intellectually honest. You know, we have to reevaluate a lot of things about our faith. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. So anyway, um, I found this to be ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Who boy, that, that, that throws the questions even just of the nature of scripture and Romanism. Right. Like, like, so what are we life? arguing about here? Like, so no wonder you need so you don't believe in soul scriptura, right? Like, mm. Mm. like now, they're saying, like, <laughs> if you want to, like a liberal Protestant, like a liberal Protestant doesn't hold to soul scriptura because they don't hold to the scriptura part. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so for them, like, it's like, well, it's their definition of scripture is essentially whatever the church says. Pretty much. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with the nature of scripture itself uh, because, you know, Peter could have lied. So to me, or, that or whoever was behind the litter. <laughs> oh, the guy claiming to be Peter was a liar. Yeah. Yep. So to me, that shows like why they couldn't hold to the soul scriptura because in their mind, scripture is just an arbitrary uh, set of books that um, uh, scripture, you know, yeah, uh, that I, the, the I, church I, just picked out. I really like this Lutheran concept of the, I think it's called the sedes doctrinae, the seat of doctrine, that it, um, that there are certain loci, certain locations in scripture upon which doctrine primarily rests. Yes. Um, so it's not merely an equal, uh, amalgamation of certain texts there's like there there is at least for certain doctrines like one key text upon which it rests and that's within the homolog uh, uh, homo uh homologumina versus the antilogomena so for people who don't know i did a whole stream with my friend river Devereux, his channel um new kingdom media on on this question um basically the homologumina are those books which are universally attested they are absolutely certain to be canonical so basically the four gospels paul's letters um and I think maybe one or two others. Um, the antilogomena are those letters which we do believe they are canonical, but it, they, they weren't established with as firm a certainty. And so out of a measure of practical safety, um, it's not that they're less authoritative, but as a measure of practical safety, the primary scriptures, the primary New Testament scriptures from which doctrine is drawn and established will be the homologumena, and they <coughs> interpret the antilogomena, not the antilogomena, the homologumena. Um, I, I do think there could be scenarios where an antilogomena could shed light on the homologumena, but otherwise, I, I actually think it's a very good and useful um, concept. Just out of practice, where you don't want to base a like thing. like a very important doctrine on something that appears once in Second Peter, mm, pretty much. Right, yeah. that, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can get behind that. Um, but to me, also, like based on what you said, also, and I made this point in the past with Steve Christie, is that um, I wouldn't, one of the reasons you wouldn't consider the Apocrypha as, uh, like canon per se is because it was not universally received at any point in history of the church. Yep. You know, so, um, so, th th you know what I mean? So if yeah. first Maccabees has not ever been universally received, hmm especially early on, right? The, those books. So why would you, even if you view them as script, you, you would have to put them in like the, kind of like the anti legomena uh, category where they would not be the basis of any uh, doctrine. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's a lot of great nuances with uh, classical Protestant um, prolegomena issues, respect <coughs> scripture, authority and all that stuff. A lot of depth that a lot of people uh, miss. Was the book of Revelation universally received? It was not, no. 
Um, not initially. Um, uh, from what I can gather from the evidence is it was early on accepted, then more doubts about it. And then uh, kind of them kind of achieve more acceptance. Yep. Later there was, on. Um, Less there was doubts, debate. more doubts, and then in kind of recognized. There was actually a whole debate in, in the Church of Rome um, between... Um, they were mainly mainly propagated by a certain presbyter in Rome called Caius, and he argued that Revelation was like not scripture, um, that it was like a heretical. It was actually something heretical and all that. Um, and then I believe it was Dionysius of Corinth, uh, a second century Corinthian bishop, who responded to him against that. Um, so this was an active debate even in the second century. So it's fascinating to see that. Um, same with Hebrews. Apparently, the Church of Rome, according to Eusebius, the Church of Rome. Um, and it's, what's very interesting is because Hebrews was allegedly written from Rome, um, the church of Rome, according to Eusebius actually denied that Hebrews was from Paul, um, which is very interesting. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's one of those other debates. Watch my streams with, um, new kingdom media. Very, um, very fascinating on that. Um, now one last thing I wanted to look at in the debate review with Swan Sonner, really the thing I want to kind of. Uh, lead us off with um it's the thing that it you listen to it and it's just like a pretty um it's a pretty innocuous statement but for some weird reason when i when i listened to it when i was at work it gave a really really ominous feeling to me and i think most people will probably miss it it'll just seem like just a basic statement of fact but when i heard it in the context of everything they were arguing before in this debate review and the debate itself like these kind of skeptical kind of arguments it was very very ominous to me and it painted a very dark future so i'm just going to i'm just going to play it I'll reshare it and then um, play it Too brief uh, but i i will close by just saying this i really enjoy enjoyed engaging gavin mm -hmm. uh, and i know as the future goes on i mean we're around like actually like the same age so I feel like as we both continue in this field, we'll both, and you you also, like the three of us are mm. part of this cohort of the new Catholic Protestant dialogue that's going on. I am very interested in engaging his work, having him engage mine. Uh, so again, probably most people watching, maybe even Jeff himself, um, okay, they're just talking about a statement of fact. They're the new generation of Catholic apologetics. Um, Think about what they're saying. That something they're acknowledging, and they're, and they're probably right. I mean, it, it's factually correct. They're the younger apologists, Swan and mm -hmm. Trent, even Trent. Um, they're the new guys representing this stuff. Um, what scared me about this, and I say legitimately scared, and I'll say why, is because they're explicitly acknowledging that this is a new generation of Catholic apologetics. Um, that they're heralding this new generation of Catholic apologetics of the pr Catholic Protestant dialogue. Um, Put that in the context of everything that's happening here. What does this new generation consist of? Faith destroying skepticism. Yeah. But, but is that anything new? It's it's technically not, but it was at least for a while dead and buried. Um, maybe there were other authors between the 16th and 20th centuries who did. But I mean, a lot Romanist, of I, but they, they I weren't it wasn't to the same, it wasn't to the same same scale as this. Like they've really gone hard 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 at it now in really reviving the jesuits and so to see that these are their normal tactics and they're explicitly acknowledging that this is part of the new generation of romanist apologetics that's very scary um because they're basically saying that the new generation of catholic apologetics is feeding people black pills on history and certainty in order to get them to come to rome that's frightening and that should frighten even other even other well-learned romanists and it, and it does um christian wagner again he has a disdain for these types of tactics and arguments um alan rule as well and others around them um and so this isn't like uh, normatively speaking i'd love nothing more than to see uh big calf <laughs> big calf like the roman catholic apologetics industry um, to make big blunders and see people become Protestant. I'd love nothing more than to see Francis make such a massive blunder that makes people become Prot. Um, not this way, though, because this kind of skepticism 
when it finally inevitably dawns on people how it destroys their own certainty, even even in Romanism, they're not going to become pro unless like by an intervention of the Holy Spirit, they drop the whole skepticism and then become pro, um, or preferably Anglican. <laughs> um, but it, as long as they imbibe that skeptical worldview, once they leave Romanism, when they see the massive errors within it, when they apply it consistently, they're not going to go East. They're not going to go to Anglicanism. They're not going to go Lutheranism. They're not going to go evangelical. They're leaving the faith entirely. And that's exact. That's ex we've already seen one very high profile case of that, at least with Steve Skojic. Not many people like, unless you're like really into like the trad Catholic online politics and all that. He was a major uh, trad Catholic writer, somewhat apologist, and he apostatized um, because of this very issue. Because um, there was his, irreconcilable, uh, irreconcilable problems with the papacy um, and like what France was doing and all that. He just couldn't put it all together. Um, he and was this, intellectually honest with them. See, so yeah. here's the thing. This is my thing with the Sadie Von, uh, Sadie Vick, no, whatever, how you pronounce that. Steve, oh, Steve, uh, Steve Skojek. Uh, at yeah. least that's how it's spelled. <coughs> I'll just say Sadie. Oh, yeah, my Latin pronunciation is not as good. Um, okay, so you got the Vatican II harmonizers, right? And you got the Sadies. And the, for, for me, like, I think there will reach a breaking point with Francis mm. where the Vatican II harmonizers can't do it anymore. It, it, I don't know when that will be, but I really think that's the trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. Where it, I guess at some point, like... I don't think they're dumb, right? So they're not going to define anything infallibly. We're like, look, if you can Newman your way into no salvation outside the church being essentially meaningless, there is no way you can't Newman yourself into like, well, we, we used to think about this about slavery. And now guess what we think about LGBT uh, relationships. Mm. Oh, yeah. the, you know we the, it, it's coming it, it mm. it's it's uh, the holy spirit as you know it's it's basically a liberal protestant argument yeah. but they're they're just going to slap some newman on it you know yeah and uh, we may be seeing the precipitation of that because i made an observation in my discord i checked the dates just to be be firm of it um february 9th the Church of England announced that they're going to bless same-sex uh, relationships. Um, fe so February 9th this year. February 10th, GAFCON and the Global South, basically the, the collective of faithful traditional Anglicanism in the Anglican Communion. February 10th, one day later, they announce they're no longer communing with the Church of England. See you later. Goodbye. We don't recognize you as our head anymore. Um, February 10th. Oh, sorry, March 10th, so barely a month later, um, the German bishops in the, Ro in the Roman system announced that they're going to uh, permit same-sex blessings. Um, it has been now 14 days, still nothing from the Vatican. Well, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the Vatican will never respond or that when they respond, it'll always, it'll necessarily be bad. But... This was supposed like they're supposed to be saying the magisterium has this super efficient system of just finding error and bang, hitting right at it. And yet here well, we are. I'll tell you what's here, here we are. The, Anglican, the, the, the faithful Anglican communion basically got a speed running world record in excommunicating a heretical sect. Their former head at that, but then the very head of the Roman communion, whose job is to do this stuff, they still haven't responded. I mean, obviously, some people will say, oh, well, it's an automatic excommunication and all that, which is like, well, hang on. Weren't you guys telling us that you need the magisterium to like actively do stuff in order to make things authoritative? So like, whatever. Um, the Vatican still hasn't responded. What's taking him so long? Uh, they um, want to see and, what and look, the pushback is before it's, it's, they, it's, they want to see with how much, how far they can push left before they get pushed back. And then they have to like, potentially, I mean, the, 
the German bishops were so <coughs> confident. Like I remember reading one of the articles. They were, they they talked with. Uh, they got comments from one of them, um, and they openly said, um, "It's going to take time, but we want to." Um, start trying to convince the rest of the Catholic world of this position, basically. They're, they're open. They're wanting to proselytize Romanism to become the big gay, basically. Um, and and here we are. The Vatican still said nothing. I mean, look, I'm not a skeptic, so I can totally grant it's bloody clear they're going against Catholic teaching, but they're trying to tell us that this is the mechanism of the magisterium in order to actually make the even clear teaching concrete and manifest it concretely. And but nothing I, happened. I don't know but, how people who, uh, somewhere in this after thing with Swan, they mentioned slavery, right? Mm, I think so. Maybe. I don't understand how the, like, uh, can you look in the transcript and, and just see where it, it mentions slavery? Just do a search on the, in the transcript. Um, no, there's nothing actually. Oh, there's one world. Okay, there's, there's one. Uh, a back thousand it up, million... a, so back it up a little bit. Let's listen to that. I think okay. that's important. Look, what you're doing is no different. Like when he says, look, your church contradicted itself on the death penalty. Mm. A thousand years ago, it's okay. Now it's not. Mm. And that's why I said, well, Gavin, how would you tell an atheist 3,000 years ago, yeah. it was okay to perpetually pass someone on as a slave to your descendants. Mm. And now you would say as a Christian, that's immoral. Mm. You're going to appeal, appeal to, to the same gradual development yeah. understanding of applying morality that I will. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't act. My, my, my answer is simpler. It's not. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so that's my answer too. But and, and the, my answer with the death penalty is it Genesis 9 requires it, right? Yeah. But based on his answer here... How is he going to protect stuff from Pope Francis or maybe maybe it's 20 years from now. Maybe it's 30 years from now. I'll probably be dead. OK, but like and I won't live to see it in, in the flesh. But like when they eventually approve same sex stuff. OK, assuming they hmm. do, maybe they don't. But like yeah. they're on that trajectory. He, they can take the same argument they use here to defend the death penalty change. And and there's no way to not consistently uh, apply that as say, put, yeah. how are you going to push back against the LGBT stuff? Oh, you know, we gradually learn through the Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth. And, you know, we make a pronouncement and here we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and this isn't us like gloating and saying like we hope these bad things happen with the Roman system. Because even if it means like, yeah, you score one for the prots, the papacy has destroyed itself. Um, promoting same-sex blessings is not a disaster for society. Souls will be destroyed. Bodies will be destroyed. Society will be a wreck. So I hope that doesn't happen. I hope, and it's possibly even likely, even if it's late, that the Vatican will stamp down on the German bishops. Because as liberally advanced as they are, I don't think they're just yet at that stage, although I'm still even now entertaining speculations. Maybe they really are. Maybe they could be that far ahead that um, even if they don't like express approval of the German bishops, that maybe it, it's entirely possible, I believe, that some kind of compromise deal could be made of some kind. Can which you bring would probably up be kind of shocking. Slides? But like... Uh, in 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 the end, I, I I do the preponderance of evidence. I do think does point towards them being excommunicated, but the issue of just how late they're leaving it, how silent they've been, if it's so long now. I, I think they want to um, put. I don't. I think the Vatican wants to uh, give see how much they can room they can give the Germans mm. without getting so much pushback. Then they have to rein them in a little. Last comment mm. from Benjamin. I want to respond to that. All right. First of all, Genesis 9, the Noahic Covenant, is uh, still in place as far as I, I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. All right. So the death penalty was mandated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's it's not like sl slavery. You can make the argument that it was tolerated. Mm. Death penalty is mandated. Yeah. Okay. And then now we're under the law of Christ. Well, does that apply to governments? The thing is, Paul and Acts 
so this is post, you know, resurrection, post ascension says, Hey, if I am uh, found uh, uh, to have uh, uh, done something worthy of death, I'm fine with being executed. And then uh, in Romans one, he basically says, yeah, people know that they have done stuff that's worthy, worthy of the death penalty. So yeah. <clears throat> that's what I say. This are ar these arguments that they're using, uh, uh, are, are, there's not a consistent stopping point that doesn't allow the homosexual stuff. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how they don't see this, but they, I guess, because they believe in. See, this is the problem that uh, Catholics have, conservative Catholics, some a lot of conservative Catholics have, is because they believe in infallibility. They, it, it, you know, they'll harmonize Vatican II, and then this is my argument for why Mark Seven uh, teaches uh, Sola Scriptura, hmm. because if you if you believe. Or at least implicitly, because if you believe that um, two sources are infallible, you're going to try try to harmonize them. Okay, so, <clears throat> but because this hasn't happened yet, right? So the Trent Horn from 50 years from now is going to deploy a similar argument to say, "Oh, uh, homosexual marriage is okay." Trent Horn today is just going to assume, like, "Oh, my church is infallible, so it won't do that." Yeah, uh, I'm. Yeah. I'm saying whoever comes after Trent Horn, there will be some yeah. sort of conservative Catholic apologist 50 years from now. You know, the conservative Catholic apologist from 100 years ago would have called all these people heretics. And not mm -hmm. just the Pope, but the you know, like the vast majority of the conservative quote unquote Catholics would have been considered heretics 100 years ago. Yeah, like my my uncle couldn't join the Boy Scouts because it was in a Protestant church in the fifties. <laughs> <coughs> okay, and like you yeah. think, you know, see what's happened in the last sixty or seventy years. You know, yeah. Good comment by Benjamin. I believe in the death penalty under the law of Christ being ongoing, based upon still uh, the Noahic laws still being valid today. I say that Romanists have made a change within the law of Christ when they change morality on the death penalty. Oh, gotcha, yep. gotcha, yep. gotcha. Okay, that's, but that's I, I, way it, yeah. the way I interpreted you, which was wrong, uh, I think, though, is kind of how he uses this. Yeah. Um, so to kind of summarize my thing on this, um, it's speculation on what Va the Vatican will do. I think it's most likely that eventually they'll clamp down on the German bishops, um, whether it will be excommunication or something not quite that, that drastic, I think remains to be wait and see. Um, I just think the fact that it's taken them this long to respond, they, they still haven't. Um, what, something like two weeks since it happened? Um, that's cause for concern. And it's not the kind, all I'm pointing out with this is that this is showing massive problems with the Roman system. There is unprecedented doctrinal corruption there. And I think that shows problems with the Roman system, but it's not something that I gloat over. It's when no, you, no, no, no. It's, I, it's you, not like the product with the Protestant world doesn't have our issues. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's we're pointing it out as like, um, See, if like an engineer, for example, he's trying to argue with this other engineer about the best way to build a certain building, um, and then he points to the fact that hey, your building's collapsing and people are dying. He points to that as a proof that the other guy's wrong and he was right, but he doesn't gloat over it. He is heartbroken over the tragedy. He really is, and I will be if this really does go ahead with the German bishops. No, somebody in the um, Q&A... But, but nonetheless, yeah. it would demonstrate a massive problem in the Roman system, and I will point that out. Somebody in the Q&A had, like, a really insightful question or comment, which uh, was, he showed the benefit and the downside of each system, hmm. Where hey they can respond to the stuff, but they uh, you know they can't correct things that are already set in stone, kind of. And <clears throat> one of the things I think Roman Catholics can't appreciate is because they view their system as like the only system, hmm. is that there's trade offs to every system. Yep. Uh, and so in the Protestant world, no, we well, I mean, if you don't count like 
pre-Constantine, like there was no enforcement mechanism. What really, you know, what really the, the irony here with the death penalty is the the blueprint for chaos thing. Mm -hmm. What you're really arguing is the ability to, uh, if you're if you actually knew what you were doing, you have to argue for the be able to execute heretics. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because if you don't have the ability to execute heretics that you don't have any mechanism to control anything. Yeah, you don't. Because practi like speaking practically, even if it's illegitimate in the Catholic system, speaking practically, they can do the thing that they mock Protestants for. They can go across the street, join a new church, or start a new one. They practically can do that, even if Romanism is true. So that criticism applies right back at them. Nothing's stopping them, unless the state can kill them. Right. And, and, and there are consistent trad Roman Catholics who say, uh, yeah, we should have that. To whom I say, okay, you're consistent. I respect you a lot. Unfortunately, I don't think Horn or Son are going to be putting out that opinion anytime soon. Well, but then I, but I could say the same thing. Like say, oh yeah, we should have the ability to kill heretics. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we don't have the ability. We don't have the uh, ability at all. And you know, they don't have the ability either. And I don't know anywhere in the world that, uh, except in this Muslim countries, they have the, that ability of uh, under their own roof. Should we become Muslim? You know, mm. um, and so a lot of this was the, the kind of like the the safety net syndrome problem, where <coughs> oh, there's all this chaos, and we're the only ones again. Where or Trent was uh, essentially saying that we say Scripture has authority, but does it really have authority? Because you can't enforce it. Scripture can't enforce itself. Yeah, yeah, no, it can't enforce itself. It's a text. Mm. But God can enforce it eventually. Mm. Um, and But there's no, you know, who's going to enforce the Pope's uh, edicts? Yeah. Yeah, very good points there. Very good points. So uh, I don't I don't think they quite understand how they're in the same boat. I mean, yeah, the final death knell to any meaningful sense of enforcement like it was already gone at that point, but basically the late, uh, I think it was in the mid 19th century when the papal state, because actually the papal state actually existed up until the 19th century, um, but it was finally conquered, I believe, by the Kingdom of Italy. Um, Something like that, yeah. In a final war. Um, and only only with Mussolini, actually, was the Vatican state reestablished, uh, re albeit in a very tiny area. So you can thank the fascists for establishing the Va the Vatican City. Um, and anyway, <laughs> but... Um, Point being, the the it, even though it was technically already gone by that point for a while, like they didn't, the Pope didn't have this imperial type of authority over the states of Brit, uh, of the of Europe for a long time. Um, it was definitively put to death when the Kingdom of Italy took over the papal state. Um, and so the meaningful the meaningful argument they could have given of the papal ability to enforce. Um, restrictions like excommunications and that by being able to say to the state hey you guys this is error this is heresy so if we excommunicate someone you have the right to kill them off um and we'll just give them to you to do that um, so that was gone for a long time i have a small little video on my channel that wasn't really well produced but i was going over an article in i think the atlantic or something where it was saying that the Chinese communists have a hard time controlling the Protestants because there's not one controlling authority mm. as opposed to the Catholics, essentially. Uh, Sino Vatican Accords, yep. So there's, there's upsides and downsides to every ecclesiology, as far as I can tell. All right. So, uh, if there's corruption, if you have a good pope who is not heretical, you can do a lot with that within his own communion. <coughs> but if Rome has erred and you believe in your own infallibility and you can't change anything, you're stuck with the errors, right? And if you corrupt the mm -hmm. pope and the pope... Um, basically tells the Chinese communists, yeah, you can uh, install your own bishops. And you're, how are the persecuted Chinese Catholics doing? You know, like, yeah, he basically sold them out. So, mm. uh, but if, 
if one pastor sells out, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, 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 pre- it prevents contagion. Yeah. There's, so there's upside and downside. Maybe I understand this as a computer person where like, you know, when you're talking about security or something, right? So if you have like one computer that uh, controls everything, right? And that computer crashes, the whole system goes out. But if you like the way Google and other companies now, what they, uh, Amazon and stuff, well, the way they work is like, if one node goes down, the whole system still operates. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's taking after this. And this is the analogy I used in my interview with Dr. Gavin Ortland on Protestant ecclesiology. It was the idea of the, of an organism known as a rhizome, um, which is basically it's a type of organism that doesn't have any central governing system. So you can cut off any, which part of it and the rest of it will still live, keep growing, keep thriving. Um, and so that's what Protestant and what we believe is biblical ecclesiology, where there is no central mortal earthly head of the whole church. Um, it's more or less kind of Cyprianic type of ecclesiology. Um, bishops or elders or whoever are their own primary authorities over their own sees. Um, and so if one goes down, that's not going to necessarily bring contagion to the rest of them. Precisely because there is no single mortal head, even though we do have the ultimate immortal head of Jesus Christ, who, who can't be corrupted. So that's a non-starter. Um, and so whatever parts get chopped up, diced, put through the apostasy ring, um, the faithful parts will remain unaffected. But then within ecclesiology like Rome, and to some extent the East, not as much though, um, when the head goes bad, that trickles down badly. And you're seeing that right now with, with the Francis pontificate, with his two moves against the Latin mass first with uh, traditionis custodes, which heavily restricted its use. Um, and even there was a companion document with it, which I think, uh, I think it was a companion document with that, which said that the, the novice order was the Lex Orandi of the church. So it straight up usurped the TLM's position. Um, even though that had technically already been done by Vatican II, really. Um, but then the more recent move, which I, I forgot the exact details, but basically made those tight restrictions even tighter. Yeah. Um, and now it, it's already been very difficult for people to find Latin masses. Like where I am in Sydney, I'm very well entrenched with the Sydney Tradcath community. You can count the number of places that do trad, uh, Latin masses in Sydney on like one hand from what I know. And there's really only two very notable ones. Um, whereas every Catholic church around here, dozens and dozens of them do novice auto. Um, and so something that was already difficult was made even harder. And it's basically on the trajectory to its full abolishment pretty much. Yeah. Um, and that's only the case because of the papal system. Um, you have other bishops like Bishop Schneider, for example, who's trying to say that the Pope doesn't have that prerogative. Um, to change things liturgically like that, to get rid of the Latin mass. Um, but then you get the the Pope, <laughs> the Pope's plane is like Michael Lofton, who uh, from my limited knowledge, he's actually correct that no, the Pope does have that prerogative. Um, and so now you're seeing many Romanists who love their Latin mass and they're suddenly feeling the effects of their own system against them. And now they're kind of wanting to go the way of Cyprian in a way um, with saying, no, this thing's true. doesn't matter what the Pope says. Um and it's kind of funny, and I and I hope it does make them think. Maybe do you really think point- when there is a breaking point? Do you think they'll go EO, or do you think they'll just go atheist? Because I have heard, I've Depends talked to so there. I have a friend on Twitter. I don't interact with them as much as I used to, but and I've heard this from a few other Catholics, where like if they found out Rome was false, they would become atheists. I was like, like, do you think Jesus rose from the dead? Like, yeah, but I only know that because Rome tells me. And it's like, okay, like, or, or, or like, it's so central to their epistemology that if something brings it down, like, I, I think the reason why the icon, like, the icon thing is not that big in the grand scheme of things, but it was such a good example of a problem that. I think that's why that caught on online like wildfire when Gavin talked about it. 
because mm. it's like one thing can cause the whole system to crash. And then it's like, what do yeah. you do? Do you become an atheist? Because it's mm. like, like, how about you just recognize Rome was wrong as opposed to just becoming an atheist and like go, uh, despairing. Like, it's very sad. I mean, I do hear Catholics who talk like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. God willing. And this is why I've been putting out the horn that Protestants writ large in their con within their confessions. And there was my recent short video on that. If you're in a confession, stick with it, assert it. Um, don't go for this mere Protestantism kind of thing. That's just as bad as mere Christianity. Well, pro okay, probably not as bad as that. But um, but yeah, argue for that, defend it, and, and collaborate with other Protestants as I do on our shared principles, which we believe are foundational and good. Um, be more assertive with arguing for the good of our confessions and our foundations because this point is coming where there's going to be a massive exodus. Arguably, it's already happening, um, but it's really going to ramp up at some point with the Francis pontificate or a successor, um, very likely there's going to be a massive exodus of Romanists who just can't take it anymore. Um, and they'll either go EO or Coptic or whatever. Well, or but the, the reality is how atheist. many conservative Catholics do we actually have? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. Um, I, like what do you, like, honestly, in, uh, I don't know what it is in Australia and I know you are more involved in, but like, if you're, you might have, I, if, if you're just, you know, we have a false sense of the percentages because that's who we interact with. Mm. Yeah. Like, at least by yeah, me, exactly. like, I, I, there's a few bumper stickers here and there of people <laughs> who go to mass every day. Maybe there's like 10 people at the local parish. <coughs> I might classify as a trad. Mm. When, when I talk to them or, or, you know, I bet you when I talk to them, they're like, when I, I went to the world meeting of families, okay, like <laughs> the vast majority of them thought like Protestants were saved. And these are the conservatives of the conservatives, percentage wise. Hmm. They thought Protestants were fine. And they thought we all believe the same thing on justification now. <laughs> okay. So, like, how um, many yeah. are actually going to uh freak out well what what are the percentages of the trads yes they they are going to freak out but like yeah what are they in the grand scheme of things they're not much yeah that's true at least by um, me but um where i am um it's it's the same thing yes the vast majority of catholics are normies whether conservative or liberal a lot of liberals we're um, Protestant, but, and that's true in a lot of churches but but numerically speaking here in sydney there are a lot of trad cats, especially um, <laughs> bolstered by the Maronites because there's a massive Lebanese contingent here and there's a lot of them. Um, like just, just today or yesterday, I think there was some, there was some like liberal ladies, like scantily clad or something that tried to go up to one of the main trad, trad Catholic centers. Um, what was the name? Belfield or something like that. They tried to go up to that church, whatever, and, and do something. And there was literally just this swarm of angry Lebanese and Maronites like starting crap and the police came to stop it and all that. Um, there's them, a lot of other non Lebanese trad cats and all that. There's big marches, like they're pro-life stuff, huge marches. Okay. So I think, like, but your, your area numerically like speaking, there's a lot, even if proportionally they're a minority. Um, but at least in my area and, and taken as a whole worldwide, there is a lot. Um, even yes. if they're not full on trad, there's numerically a lot of Catholics who take the consistency of their faith seriously. And so even, even if they're a minority, I think once things really hit, once crap really hits the fan, there's going to be a very noticeable dip. It'd probably be a big deal in Africa. Probably. I'm not sure about yeah. Latin America. Latin America seems to have gone pretty liberal. Uh, Ireland <laughs> is pretty liberal. Oh, Ireland's <laughs> It, you can't even call that Catholic in any meaningful sense. Hey, Muslims, come do your prayers. In that's <laughs> really weird, like how how far Ireland has gone, right? And then Italy, and it's not a good trend because it's a trend. Like I don't, I don't expect them to become Protestant uh, without like the Holy Spirit uh, intervening. Yep, yep, hundred percent, hundred percent. Oh, this is this is funny. Graham Stacy, bro, is slavery simple because the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, um, Graham, do me a favor. 
So Jesus, Jesus didn't invent that statement. Can you tell me what book of the Bible he got that from? Don't answer for him, Jeff. Look it up yourself, Graham. What book of the Bible did Jesus get that from? Um, that's all I'll say. <laughs> that is a fair comment. You're in for a shock. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, um, is there much else to say? Or... No, I think we're uh, coming down the home stretch here. Um, yeah, I, home I guess that, that would be my only summary is like, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Yeah. Exactly. If exactly. you're not, you may not be consistent, but someone coming after you is going to be consistent. An atheist mm-hmm. is going to come in, look at these arguments, <coughs> and basically be like, "Yep, yeah, well, no, okay, whatever," you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and yeah, that'll be my. I guess we've said everything I need to say, so I don't need to summarize a few. Um, but I guess it's just a call to action. Protestants recognize the inconsistencies in these arguments um likewise with roman catholics like recognize these inconsistencies hold yourselves to equal standards equal weights and measures um don't freak out when something is hard you have to put in work things don't come easily to you exactly yeah you don't have infallible knowledge yeah exactly you're you're a creature don't freak out like oh i can't know anything yeah exactly life is life we have to do hard things to, to know even necessary things um uh, lay people who don't know much on these issues don't buy into these very skeptical arguments because once you do, you're going down a very bad rabbit hole for your whole faith. Um, even if you seem to get the safety in the arms of Rome, um, it is very likely that if you're consistent and you look at these issues, you're going to be very quickly disillusioned and you're going to be in an even worse state eventually. Um, so yeah, mark and avoid these arguments, people point them out uh, and even other Romanists. Cause I genuinely think even if this is a problem within Roman apologetics, the ramifications go well beyond that. This can affect the faithful of the, the faith of tons of people. Other Romanists root out these kinds of arguments from your own ranks, exhort your big public faces to not do them. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I can really say. Just mark and avoid repent and believe the gospel read your holy scriptures because they are a clear path to salvation um even hey, if they're not clear rely on the only uh, when uh when paul commits the ephesians i uh, i believe in acts 20 he won't see him again he commits them to god's word okay mm-hmm. like that's where you have that's where you have to rely he doesn't commit them to it uh, a pope or say go to rome or whatever he just commits them to god's word and 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 the same is true for us today the church is an aid the church you know, but it's not infallible no church is infallible protestants have messes catholics have messes eastern orthodox have messes um it you really only the only anchor you have in this life is scripture i would like to read um the very inspiring statements uh, a very inspiring statement from the end of the well preserved portion of the letter of polycrates the bishop of one of the bishops of asia minor he represented the wider bishop uh bishop uh, bishop's council of asia minor during the Easter controversy, when Rome tried to enforce his will upon Asia Minor and they resisted with regards to when to celebrate Easter, he said the following, I too, Polycrates, the least of all you, live according to the tradition of my relatives, some of whom I have followed. Seven of them were bishops and I am the eighth, and my relatives have always kept the day when the people discarded the leaven. Therefore, my brothers, I who have lived 65 years in the Lord and, and conferred with brethren from all parts of the world, and have studied all of Holy Scripture, am not afraid of threats, for men better than I have said, we must obey God rather than men, citing Acts 5.29. That's the attitude we all need to have. Yeah, We cannot give in to the tyranny of any specific bishop. Everybody is accountable to the word of God. Everybody. That's, that's the only way to escape this. All right. Amen. All right. Yeah. So, um, oh, thank you very much for this, Benny. Very awesome. Very appreciated. I don't know what a PLN um, is, but I assume it's I, I don't know what its value is, but appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, 
but yeah so that's um that's basically it for this stream so uh yeah i guess we've said everything um jeff thank you so much for coming on again thank Finally, you another collab Another banger, I reckon. Another one out of the park. Uh, really, really helpful for many people, I think. Uh, yeah, when uh, when your yeah. troll was calling, uh, uh, talking about a, a straggly beard, and you can smell. I didn't know if it's the stench uh, from through his monitor. I didn't know if he's talking about you or me. Uh, he's talking about me. Oh, That's, uh, uh, I think he's encountering the smell of masculinity for the first time. But anyway, thank you. I smell all. okay. <laughs> it must be you. Uh, no comment um thank you all very much for watching thank you so much jeff for joining us thank and, you and uh yeah i hope you all learned a thing or two from this i hope you've all been very well bolstered um in what to look out for in this so anyway ladies and gentlemen thank you so much i hope you all have a lovely day or evening god bless <laughs>